Environment Minister, and we start off with topical questions. And I call Paul Frew. Mr. Speaker, can I ask the Minister, has he any concerns with the amount of anaerobic digester applications, and in particular the anaerobic digester that will be fed entirely uh, by chicken litter in the Bellamina area, uh, which is the first of its kind? And can the Minister answer how he can justify the current neighbour notification system, which, which, which has caused a lot of concern and suspicion by the local community and to what could be safe and progressive technology. Thank you, uh, Mr Speaker. Thank Mr Frew for his question. There are indeed quite a number of applications within the system for anaerobic digesters. I am not familiar per se with the application, the specific application to which the member, however, refers. With the issue around neighbour notification, I believe that we do, as a department, need to look at how that is done to reduce and remove any room for suspicion or paranoia, paranoia among local communities about not just applications for anaerobic digesters, but any applications at all. Uh, on the whole, anaerobic digesters are something we should be supportive of, however, not in any place and not at any price. Paul Frew. Okay, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Is the Minister concerned with the lack of knowledge within the Planning Department on this type of anaerobic digestion? And is he minded to treat this uh, type of application like wind farms, whereby he'd bring it into the centre of Planning Department? Well, each application has to be treated on its own merits and judged on its own merits. The applications of wind farms, to which he refers, being brought into the centre, are generally Article 31 applications that are viewed as having massive regional significance. And uh, should an application for an anaerobic digester be deemed to be of that scale and of that significance, it will be. As regards a perceived lack of knowledge within the department on how to process these, that, that's something I'll look at. It's imperative that our planning officers are fully upskilled and fully aware of every type of application that comes before them. I'm confident we have a very skilled workforce. However, technology changes, application changes, and it's vitally important, and I'm determined, that the plan and service changes to keep abreast of these developments. Oliver McMillan. Yeah, does the Minister fear that uh, single-tier legislation would make the taxi industry less accountable, considering everyone would be able to hail and ride? Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, thank you uh, for that question, Mr. McMullen. The, the move towards single tier taxi legislation was due to be complete by September this year, 2013. However, with the agreement of the Environment Committee, my predecessor decided to postpone the implementation until September 2014 in order to give the industry and those within it time to prepare for the implementation so that its impact will be less onerous on operators and drivers and so it will be more affordable for them. As regards the implications of the move towards single tier on competition, I have met with several, several dozen <laughs> taxi drivers and representatives of taxi drivers and companies and heard many concerns and many views. It is a complicated piece of legislation. It is also an important piece of legislation to improve standards within the industry, to improve accessibility, particularly for those with disability. And I am determined that we use the year but that, that we have bought through postponing the implementation of this legislation to ensure that we get it right. And I am happy to work with those representatives of the taxi industry with committee members to make sure that we make it as effective as possible. Oliver McMillan. Can I thank the Minister for his answer? But can, can, the, can the Minister tell us, has any advice been sought from any other jurisdiction that have implemented a single tier taxi system to establish that it has been successful? As I have said, this piece of legislation is complicated. I believe it was actually the first piece of legislation, though, passed within this House, and the fact that we are here five years after its passage 
and it still hasn't moved anywhere is an indication of just how complex it is and how important it is that we get it right. There have been studies done of the taxi industry elsewhere. Every country, indeed most cities, have their own particular taxi needs and taxi issues. I think the case in point being Belfast, as we look in the north here, has been the place most severely impacted by the introduction of single tier and I suppose Belfast public hire and the fear that they have that the, um, what the impact might be in them. And I think, like I say, it's, it's, it's very important that we work together. I'll also be working with my colleague, the Minister for Regional Development and issues around ranks and bus lanes as to how they can best be facilitated. Question number eight has been withdrawn. Sammy Wilson. Has the Minister any plans to introduce the daft and the economy destroying idea of his predecessor by introducing a climate change bill for Northern Ireland? <laughs> thank you, Mr. Speaker. I uh, thank you, Mr. Wilson. <laughs> I'm not sure that my predecessor had any <laughs> daft ideas. <laughs> he, had, he, he, did, he did have many daft ideas. <laughs> <laughs> But, but, may, but maybe not as many as some of my other predecessors in this post. <laughs> However, uh, climate change is a massive, massive issue that we face, uh, regardless of maybe differences of opinion about its cause. At least I think we can now all accept that it does exist, and the need to do something about it exists also. The introduction of a climate change bill might be one way. To, to address it. However, I am not at this time 100 per cent convinced that it would be the best way to address it, because I think what we do need is buy-in from all departments, from all members, from all sectors of the community, particularly the, the business community. And at this moment in time, I am more minded to favour a climate change strategy, where we get people on board, we get those who might have reservations about a bill on board and just make sure that we get them all working towards reducing uh, greenhouse gas emissions, carbon emissions, and making Northern Ireland a better place in terms of environment and a better place in the, the European and world level in terms of environment. Sammy Wilson. I'm not too sure whether the Minister is accepting that it was a daft idea and he's now trying to roll back from it, but I welcome at least his, his caution. Would he not accept that, given the fact that uh, there has been no global warming for the last 15 years, even though CO2 emissions have been rising, and that the bill would affect farmers, businesses, job seekers and the economy in Northern Ireland, that it is much better to move away from regulation, additional costs on businesses through trying uh, to introduce such legislation at a time when already uh, we are struggling for competitiveness here in Northern Ireland. Thank you, uh, Mr. Wilson, for that supplementary. I don't, however, accept that regulation is necessarily bad for business. It's possible to create and strive for a better environment and a stronger economy, but it's why it's so important that I and that we as Assembly work with those interests that Mr. Wilson has mentioned, those in agriculture, those in industry, those in the agri-food industry particularly, which is so, so important to our local economy in order to address their fears, address their concerns. But I don't particularly think the logic that uh, Mr Wilson is espousing there is particularly helpful in doing so. I don't also or either accept that there has been no increase in, in global warming over the past 15 years. Trevor Clark. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. Um, can I ask the Minister, given that uh, NILAS targets are fast approaching us, does he believe that the North West application, given that it's the only one at the moment, is cap uh, capable of being the only solution in Northern Ireland presently? I uh, thank Mr. Clark for that question. The issue of waste, how we deal with it, and the infrastructure that we have, or to date have not, got in place to deal with it is again a very important one, a, a burning issue in some constituencies, one could say myself included. 
I have met with the North West Regional Waste Management Group, as I have met with the others, both individually and collectively, in an order that they work together, that we work together with them as a department, and uh, NILGA and local councils work with them to make sure that whatever solution we come up with to our undeniable waste problem is one that works. I thank the Minister for his response. And I do note, uh, Mr. Speaker, that he did meet the North West Group. However, um, the ART Group for the east of the province uh, were considering an application in the Molusk area. Would it not be more viable in terms of a, a location somewhere in that particular area rather than, and I mean, I know my colleagues particularly interested in the, uh, the ozone layer, but rather than, transporting, rather than transporting the goods from the Belfast area to the North West? As and when any waste management group supports a viable appointment business case to the Department, the Department will consider any case for funding on the basis of our assessment of the project's contribution to Northern Ireland's compliance with European landfill diversion targets. The ARC 21 project comprises a combination of mechanical biological treatment and energy from waste through incineration. And the remaining uh, Better for the procurement recently announced its plans for the new facilities in Molusk that must, to which Mr Clark referred and has been engaged in pre-application discussions with the planning service. Katrina Rand. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, there has been a recent damning report from the Commons uh, Public Accounts Committee in relation to um, Sellafield. And I wonder, is the Minister aware of this report and the dangers to people and the environment here in the north of Ireland? <coughs> Guramai Ogut Mawiahas Asankesh Samuel Shin. Thank you for that interesting question. I'll have to plead ignorance on that one. I'm unaware of the report. I will make it my business to look at that report, to read that report, and to study its findings. I am fully aware of Sellafield. I'm fully aware of the public concern around the dangers posed to the public, and I'm fully determined to do anything within my remit as department as Minister for the Environment here to mitigate against those damages. Well, uh, thank you for the response. I am a bit concerned that your department didn't make you aware of the report and I welcome the fact that you'll now go and study it. I would ask also that you make representation to the relevant authorities because it is a damning report and there are they're ten years behind in terms of safety and waste. Okay, I do undertake to make the, the relevant representation. I know uh, my party colleague, the MP for South Down, has been vociferous in her concerns and those of the South Down constituency around Sellafield. So I give you my guarantee I'll look at it now. Jonathan Craig is not in his place. Mitchell McLaughlin. Mr. McLaughlin. <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, Speaker. And to ask the Minister uh, if he could indicate to us how he intends to ensure strong uh, community and accountable community planning as part of the transfer of powers to uh, the new configuration of local councils. Thank uh, the member for his question, and, and I'll do my best to answer it. The transfer of powers to local councils is vitally important. We voted here a couple of weeks ago to pass the Local Government Reform Bill to committee stage, where it now sits and have actually have granted an extension to committee stage so that the committee, and I'm sure Mr Boylan is looking forward to it, can spend more time properly scrutinising it and making sure it's, it's fit for purpose. Community planning is a massive issue within that. It's a massive opportunity within that to empower local communities, to empower local individuals to play an active role in shaping their own towns, cities and regions. The Department, well, through my predecessor, acquired additional funding from the Executive to provide training and capacity building for local councillors, but also, importantly, for local community groups and others who would be interested in 
and indeed vital to the community planning process. Members, that concludes topical questions. We now move to order.